Okie doke. A bit of review. So last week we covered Pshara and Leafy Mishura Zedin. And, you know, these things, you know, what are they and what do they do? I mean, two different aspects to this thing. You know, first, these are quasi-halachic in the sense that, well, you can, you can put them in a halacha book, you can legislate them. Something like Lush and Hara, let's say. You, know, you can make laws of Lush and Hara. But the actual execution of the mitzvah, being able to abstract and figure out how you're going to go about doing it, well, that you have to use human reason. It's not like putting on tefillin. You know, it's not like keeping Shabbos, where it's very clear and black and white, what can you do, what can't you do, and that's it. You have to put the human heart into, into these. Number two, you know, the, these two mitzvahs, the basic function, you know, what they actually get done is they're reducing rigidity in society and they're, in, and they're increasing flexibility. It's basically solving the, 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 you know, one problem they're solving is this idea that within society we have to have hierarchies, we have to have structure in society, but at a certain point, you know, societies can become too tyrannical. They become top-heavy. And we have to have certain mechanisms in place to, well, you keep order, you have to keep society, you have to have the hierarchy. But you have to be able to, to allow a certain level of flexibility so you don't end up oppressing people. The second thing that these do is they counteract the confirmation bias that we are constantly struggling with. That we... we on a fundamental level, we are always looking for what we already know and trying to justify it. And it's very hard for us to really appreciate new information, things that contradict our beliefs. We identify with what we know a little too much. And from a clinical standpoint, I find it's very hard to treat somebody who comes in, say, and they think that they're a, a prophet, they're a navi. It, it, yeah, it really just annoys the heck out of me. I mean, I have to, like, leave the whole rabbi thing at the door because, like, from a halakhic perspective, no, I'm sorry, you're not a navi. Like, you, you, I don't care what your experience is. It's in black and white. There's mechanisms. We know how this works. But they swear to it. They think that they're, 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 they're a navi. They have ESP because in their experience, there are times where they, they sense something is going to happen. They sense someone is going to do, do something or say something, and they end up doing it. But what happens is they never really keep track of all the times they're wrong. Because if they did, they'd end up figuring out and seeing, oh, wait a second, it's really, uh, 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 really by chance they're guessing correctly. You know, the other, the, another manifestation of this problem is, say, you know, someone who's learning to be a clinical psychologist, you know, they're learning about all these really funky, wonderful mental illnesses, and they start thinking, oh, my gosh, do I have an anxiety disorder? Oh my gosh. Do I have a personality disorder? They start, they start diagnosing everybody and, you know, everybody in their family and themselves. So it's like the first year and a half you're going through clinical work. You're just a pain in the neck to everybody. Sir, I'm going to need you to see a doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to see a doctor. <laughs> So those are examples of confirmation bias. We're constantly looking to, to prove the things we already know. And we're, we're quite close to learning things that are new. So Pshara and Leafy Mishura Sadin are ways of getting around this confirmation bias. Can I try So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the third factor here that I listed for you guys last week, Seichel Hayashar. To really tackle what Seichel Yashar is and just how important this idea is in Halacha, we have to go all the way back to the beginning of creation. How, how did we get the Sheva Mitzvah's B'day Noach? So the Gemara in Sanhedrin, that is a Mach Locus, what did Adam Rishon receive from God? And this is an important question because we have a principle, Ein Onshim Eleim Kein Mazirin. We only get potched by God, we only get punished by Hashem for things we already know. So if we don't know it, it's not justifiable for anyone to be punished. So it's Machlokas. Surprise, surprise. Rabbi Yochanan asserts that, that within the opening, uh, the opening uh, sukim, we're introduced to Adam Rishon, 
he gets chava, and God tells him that he can't eat from he can eat from all the trees except one. From that pusik, he derives all seven of the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach. You know, the pusik says, and, and the Lord God commanded man, saying, that of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat from it, for on the day that you eat from it you shall die. So how do you get the Sheva Mitzvahs from this guy? You know, how do you pick those guys out? From those sentences? From that yeah. sentence, we learn all seven. So here, so here we go. And the Lord God commanded. Hashem says there's a tzivui. From this we learn that there is such a thing as justice. Courts of law. That's the first of the Sheva Mitzvahs. The phrase the Lord, Hashem, is, is the isser of is the prohibition of cursing God's name. That he who was, is, and will be doesn't really logically make sense. You can curse such a thing. It's just being. You can't curse being. It's a dumb idea. Elokeinu, God. In what context could you not... <coughs> what do you mean you can't curse being? Like, why are you... I mean, the prohibition is taking God's name and cursing God with God's name. That's the, that's, that's the prohibition. Okay. It's because if God was, is, and will always be, it's like, it's like it just defies reason that God's not going to curse himself. He's, he's a timeless being. It doesn't make sense to say such a thing. It's just, it's irrational. Elokeinu, well, that, as far as the name of God implies, is power and force. And this, 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 this part of the Pusik prohibits idol worship. You know, one, we're saying God is the only force. You know, and then the fact that the word Elokeinu is plural in form uh, implies, well, all forces are God. There's no other force in town. So, no idol worship. When Hashem specifically identifies man in the Pusik, Adam Arishon, well, I mean, that's a call for life. You were commanded to do such and such. Well, that implies, well, you better not die. You can't kill, so to speak. That for commandments to be, you have to have living creatures receive them. That's a prohibition of murder. Lay more that you know God said to, to Adam Rishon. This is an interesting one because they derive out of this uh, sexual misconduct. That's the prohibition from that word to say. And I put a lot of thought into that because it, it's like, how do you get how do you get that from that word? And I think it's something like words words. On a, on, a, on, a to... on a basic level, they order our experience. We can't, we can't live in the world in a straightforward way, in a way that, that um, not to beat a dead horse with the word over and over, but like you can't live orderly without being able to speak. Communicating with one another is the basis of society. Well, what's the basis of society? The family. So don't mess that one up. The puzzle continues, you can have of every tree in the garden. Well, this is the idea of ownership. God is giving us permission to use these trees. Per force, we get theft. You can use this, but not that. Don't steal. And finally, the idea of, okay, but there's one that you, that, that this is the general concept of being able to eat fruit. Well, if you can eat fruit, you can't eat, well, this time in history, you can't eat meat. Or, you know, Abram and Achai. You can't rip off the limbs from animals and eat those things. So, like, when in time, was it everyone after? Nope, that Adam Rishon got him. Okay, fine. That was, yeah, that was... He told the boys. That, yeah, he told Adam Rishon, that was, that was this Pusik. What if people are not, like, have no idea? How are they supposed to find out? Hold on, that's the whole class. That is exactly the whole class. Do all the non-Jews know the seven mitzvahs? I'm going to be arguing yes. That's the class. We're going to have to get there. I don't know if we can get there in 15 minutes, people who were late. Yeah. But no, we'll, 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 see, we'll see how we can. <laughs> Not to name names. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Okay. All right, so let's, 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 let's bring it in because actually we have a lot of ground to cover. Maybe we can get it taken care of today. Okay. So that's, so that's Rabbi Yochanan's position. All seven were given to Adam Rishon at that moment in time. 
It wouldn't be Judaism if we didn't have a dispute in Halacha. So we have Rabbi Yehuda's position. And he asserts, no, only the prohibition of Avodah Zarah was given to Anamarishon. So now we have a fundamental problem. Oh, because otherwise Cain and Hevel did a seven minutes. Exactly. We have a fundamental problem because if Rabbi Yehuda is correct, then, then why is Hashem, say, punishing Cain and Hevel? He killed his brother. So that, doesn't that disprove that... So we got a problem. That's exactly right. We got a problem. Okay. Wait, who says that it... Which opinion is whose? Rabbi Yochanan says, Rabbi Yochanan says that all seven were given to Adam Rishon. Why are they called B'nai and Rabbi, and Rabbi Yehuda... They just got better press. And Rabbi Yehuda <laughs> only says that Avodah Zarah was explicitly given. They should call him B'nai Adam. Okay. Yeah. Now... What, I, what I'm basically arguing is that all of these are based on Seichel HaYashar. That it is legitimate for Hashem to punish someone who murders another human being because to do such a thing goes, goes against human reason. That we have this principle of Ein Onshim Eliim Kein Mazirim. You only get punished for things that you know. Well, it, it's intuitive that you don't go around killing people. It's intuitive you set up systems of, of, uh, systems of justice and, and courts on a basic level. It makes sense that you should, you should have a, a strong society based on the family. All these things don't contradict reason at all. In fact, they're based on human reason. And so the argument that Rabbi Yehudi would have to make is that it was unnecessary for God to say them because you already know them just because you're human. So they still it's like we have them. a moral compass. This is our yep. moral compass. Yes. Except for those serial killers who just, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, they 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 got problems. They got serious. <laughs> it's, it's mental illness. You know, they're they're. Okay. So it's not true. So so if we. Hmm? So it's not true what Rabbi Yehuda says because, or it could be true, but they would, but, kind of have us still had. Rebbe Yehuda and Rebbe Yochanan are going to are, are the, the only place they argue is going to be would they get these seven or one, mm-hmm. but they're not going to disagree on this fundamental point that human reason demands that you should follow human reason, that halacha is not some dead legalistic code you're given. Although there it is legalistic, although there's a lot of details that that have to be spelled out that you do have to rely on revelation for, but there's a lot that you don't. So we're gonna take a little, little stroll down human history, and we're gonna get a very, very weird picture here throughout all of Bereshi, starting with Stom and Amora, the destruction of those two cities. In Sefer Yechezkel, we know exactly why they were destroyed. They didn't give tzedaka, they didn't give charity, and that's why the cities were destroyed. Where is that in the Sheva Mitzvahs? Doesn't exist. Dormabu. You know, the Pusik says that they had a problem with Hamas and Hishtachat Zera. Basically, this is a bit of a machlokus, you know. This might not fit into my theory so easily, but according to many positions, well, what was the problem there? They were they were they were getting married and specifically not having children. And they had bad attitudes. They weren't polite. Where is being polite in the Sheva Mitzvahs? It's not. But the whole world is destroyed over these two things. Moab and Ammon, when the Jewish people were ending their 40 years in the desert, they had food, they had water, they had Nisim supporting them in a physical sense. So they get to the border, and Moab and Ammon says, says says the Chumash, that they are punished for not providing the Jewish people with bread and water. Well, like, we didn't need it. Like, that's a silly thing to say. Why would they give the Jewish people bread and water? We had the bear Miriam. We have the man descending from heaven. Like, yeah. we got what to eat. You know, way better than whatever they got offering. <laughs> but rather, it was, it, was a, it was an oversight in being properly, being mechabed, the Jewish people. That, they, that it was against human reason for them not to celebrate us coming into Eretz Israel. It's not so much they have to give us food to help us survive, but to actually celebrate our entry into the, into the land. 
And for this, there are many restrictions on their ability to actually convert to Judaism. The girls get a free pass. Guys have a hard time who they can marry. And in terms of how long they have to wait, and how many generations until they can actually join the Jewish people, there is a, there is a, a big limit on how, how much we allow them to integrate into Jewish society. Avi Melech, when he took Sarah to be his wife. What did he do wrong? Where is that in the Sheva Mitzvahs? And here we have Avram and Sarah coming into Mitzrayim. All right, honey, here's the deal. Pretend you're my sister. So from a halachic perspective, I think I, I, this kills me when I think about it. it. In that moment, it became usser for, it would have been legitimate for, for the Mitzrayim to kill Avraham if they discovered him hanging out with his wife. Because he enters into, into Egypt saying, we're just brother and sister. That is one of the Sheva Mitzvahs. You don't do that. And in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the halachic system, well, testimony and what you say actually matters. We're not taking DNA tests. So if they would have been caught, it would have been completely justified under God's law to kill Avram, Avinu, and Sarah. Wait, why? Because you lied? If, if they were because they, had the, they, were give, they, they gave themselves the social status of brother and sister. So it would have been legitimate what is that? for, for, for uh, uh, improper intimate relationships. I thought Egypt oh, that but stuff. he just yeah. did it in order to stay alive. True. Fine. Just the caveat is, and if they would have been doing husband and wife stuff, it would have been legitimate for them to receive the death penalty. I just think that's kind of interesting. I mean, if you think about Avram in general, I mean, like it, it wasn't until he was much older that he actually accepted the idea that God existed. All the while, over... But it would only be bad if they did it in front of people, though. If they got caught. Well, yeah, okay. but it, but but even still, like take take Avraham's life for like ninety years, he was he was serving idols, according to the Shev and Mrs. B'nai Noach, he should have been killed. Bad guy, new no, new. No. And it's a fun. You don't think of Avraham Avinu as based on the Sheva Mitzvahs warranting to be killed. You know, like it's like wait a second. So Avi Melech, what did he do? Well, some guy comes in with his sister, might as well marry her. She seems like a nice lady, and the punishment is that his entire nation ceases being able to have babies. Well, he didn't do anything wrong technically under the Sheva Mitzvahs. He just lacked Der Heretz. Sure, you're the king. Sure, you know, as a king, you do own everybody. It's like, it's your country. It's more, than, it's more than your country. It's your everything. So like from a legalistic perspective, it might burn modern ears, but he did have a right to do it. It just wasn't Derek Eretz. It's not polite to it's not polite to kidnap people that way. That way. Yeah. <laughs> that way. <laughs> so we kind of left with this, wait a second, you know, especially with the Avram thing, is like, well, all these all these circumstances where God is destroying cities, he's destroying the world, he's denying people being able to join the Jewish people and have a greater chelik olam haba. You know, like, he's denying babies being born. All for things that do not get listed in the Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Noach. But every single one of them, human reason would say, don't do that. You know, yeah, you have to give charity to people. You know, poverty is something you cannot get rid of naturally. You actually have to have all of society work on that one. You don't just kidnap some guy's sister. Give me a break. You know, find you're the king and maybe there's like a legal loophole. But come on, it's a stupid legal loophole. You just don't do it. You know, all these things, you just have to think two seconds and you know it's wrong to do. And when you look at the stakes, you know, when, you know, as far as you know, from, from a halakhic perspective, you know, well, you know, someone who doesn't keep the Sheva mitzvahs well, their property's hefker. What's their punishment from a Jewish perspective? If they lose their wallet, you don't return it. All their property's hefker. So then why wouldn't these human reason things be part of the Shevet Mitzvah B'nai Noach if they're comp... Like, also the Shevet Mitzvah B'nai Noach are pretty much common sense. Like exactly, ability. exactly. I'm arguing that that's exactly the point. They are a part of what people have to do. That so what, it's all like a, like a like kind of subcategory? That, of that it's, it's worse than that. It's like maybe these Sheva Mitzvahs, maybe we'll, we'll cut you some slack. 
and that the argument between Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Yehuda is maybe they're not exactly so obvious. Maybe. But come on, these are just blatant. And you see it in the, the way that we treat it from a, from a legalistic perspective. Like I'm saying, well, you know, someone who doesn't keep the Sheva mitzvahs, their property is considered hefker. You don't have to return it. You don't have to do Shabbos Aveda and return their lost objects. But man, if you're not going to have Derech Eretz, God's going to destroy the world. That's the punishment. Is that these things make way more sense. And because they make more sense, you're more obligated in them than the actual black and white rules set down in legal texts. I wanted to present you guys, I don't know if we're going to have enough time, but I want to present you guys the, the medrash outlining the moment that the Jewish people received the Torah. The whole, and when you, when you really sit down and you treat Midrashim in this way, you don't just take Midrashim as, as fun stories, but you really have to break them open. They're all highly symbolic. That when you treat them in this way, you find really cool stuff. And so the Midrash of the receiving of the Torah is exactly the sort of thing where the primary message of this Midrash is that Torah it makes sense. In the sense that these are things that the human reason demands that we do. So the Gemara and Shabbos presents this medrash that there we are at Har Sinai. We've already said Nasav and Ishma. We have already said to God from this very spiritual, emotional sort of place with conviction, you know, we will do, just tell us what you want. So we've already committed. So what does Hashem do? He takes Har Sinai and he inverts it like this empty tub, this gigis in Hebrew. Har gigis, that's how they, they, they reference this medrash. This is the Har gigis medrash. And he says to the Jewish people that if y'all take on the Torah, mutav, good. But if you don't, vim lav, shamtia kvuratchem, this will be your burial place. That's the medrash. So then the Gemara kind of responds, well, well, that's actually, you know, putting it that way. There's a really, really good reason why we're actually not obligated in keeping any of the Torah. So we have a principle that when you're under duress, that's not, you know, if you're under duress, you're forced to do something. Well, we don't consider you, uh, your actions legally binding. So if you're forced to makabal the Torah, by law, you really didn't makabal it. Yeah. Something about getting the Torah, um, did God tell every nation when he asked if they wanted the Torah, you, this will be your burial place, or only the Jews did he say this? Only the Jewish people. Yeah, it's this moment. And so the way the Gemara ends is, oh, okay, well, fair point. Uh, during, during the time of Achshverosh and Esther, the whole Purim story, oh, the Jewish people received the Torah out of love, and ha, 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 we're obligated in the mitzvahs. So right now we're not obligated, but during Esther we are? Right, so what's going on? It, this whole thing sounds funny. Oh, that's all Midrash. That's the Midrash. That's the Midrash. So the whole thing sounds funny. You know, so we're taking this at face value. It's like, okay, interesting story. Like, are we really, like, really, just, wow. Like, so really, from, from the moment of the giving of the Torah to the Purim story, we weren't obligated to keep the mitzvahs? The answer is no. But like I said, you have to approach this Midrash as as a metaphor to be able to get that. Why would we be, I don't know if you answered this already, but mm. why would we even be given mitzvot in the first place if we didn't have to keep them? Yeah, the whole, yeah it's irrational. It's a silly, it's a silly idea. Yeah. Right, you're 100%. So, so it's like this. In the Medrash, when it says that a Kosh Baruch who flips over Har Sinai like a tub, it's basically, the, the symbolism there is basically like, you know, not accepting the Torah is just, it's the same thing as flipping the world upside down. There's inherent, there's inherent reason and meaning in the world. And rejecting giving the Torah, saying, no, I don't want it, would be tantamount to flipping the world upside down. It's against human reason to do such a thing. And even this idea of a tub is kind of like, well, what's a tub? It's a, it's a, it's a hollow object. 
So it's basically this idea of, of the world looking like it's got body to it, that there's something there, but really what's behind, what's underneath? Just some hollow object. Hashem goes on, the section where he says, Imatem akavu Torah mutav, that if you accept the Torah, it's good. The word mutav is a, ref- is, um, is a reflexive verb. It's meaning that it's inherently good. Well, here, just the idea of choice implies uh, implies reason and implies it pl- implies that there's that there is a judgment call to be made, that there is a there is a right, there is a wrong. That receiving the Torah makes sense inherently. And the ending, the imlav shamtia kvuratchem. Here will be your burying place. Here you will die. There are two ways of looking at that. It's like here you will die, meaning you will get no olam haba. Or here you will die, meaning sure you'll live, you'll live a life. But rejecting, rejecting human reason, it might as well be dead. Some, it's, something like, it's something like that. If you're, if you're not going to actually live a life based on reason and logic, it's not such a life. And that's the meaning of the medrash. It's so weird because a lot of things are reasoning logic, but like some things aren't. Yeah. But like mo, you know. And we covered that. That was the idea right. of chok as being a reminder yeah. of that because the Torah makes so much sense. I mean, it's a reminder reasoning. that it's God's so, law. Yeah. Just say like yes, Hashem says I'll do it. And yeah. Okay, The Rambam and his son Avram ben Rambam takes this idea of taking seriously human reason one step further. He goes so far as to, to make the claim that if you just believe things at face value, that's actually a prohibition. It's an iser. So not to be gullible? Not to be gullible is an iser der Reise. <laughs> so it, it, I think this this position this position is a bit more complicated because it's like well you're not born knowing everything so I think it's more fair to kind of look at the way the Rambam looks at learning and human knowledge is like the more that you understand you're actually building your neshama so it's something like there's usable knowledge and attained knowledge where sometimes like for for most of your like in your life you have to you have to take you have to trust people to a certain extent to get on in life it's like take the 59 bus you'll be able to make it to gula you know like don't turn left turn right like these things aren't provable per se we do trust people so there's a sort of lag time that yeah you have to rely on others but the idea is that okay there's usable knowledge where we're just worried about the outcome but you have to constantly be learning you have to constantly test out these things you're told and never accept anything at face value. You have to integrate all knowledge. And that's what makes you a, a person that can live forever, to live in Olam Haba. And that's entirely predicated on human reason. Um, in the beginning you said it's a sword to believe things at face value. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so don't believe that face value, and then you have to rely on others, but also use your knowledge to constantly like, be doing new things, learning new things. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. And the last point I wanted to make real quick here is the idea of svara in halacha. Because you know, I told you way back when that you know, in the halachic system, we're not so much, in terms of generating halacha, it's not so much based on human reason. And, and one way of framing that is to, to make creation of halacha more objective, less subjective, more scientific. And that's a fair thing to say. But there is room for svara in terms of the expansion. When you're presented a pusik, you're presented the scientific objective rule, there is room to expand on, on halachic ideas. So an example of this sort of thing would be, well, if there's a pusik that after you eat your food, you say a bracha. Great. That's a, that's a chiyuv der raisa. And that's black and white. We got that halacha. But based on svara, we extend this halacha by saying you also have to make a bracha rishona. That's based on human reason. And that's a chiyuv der raisa. Or the idea that you shouldn't, you shouldn't kill another person to save your own skin. 
That's another idea. We have in black and white that's an Isidur Isid to murder. And I'm even making the argument that's something you don't even need a Pusik for, necessarily. It, human reason demands it. But based on Svara, that, hey, wait a second, we're not allowed to kill people, we extend this halacha by saying something like, how can, you know, the way they put it, very poetic, how can you say your blood is redder than your friends? So it's one, it's one, of, it's one of the three biggies we would rather die than commit. We don't kill people. And if under duress, if you know, some guy has a gun to your head and says, you kill your friend or I blow your brains out, so you say shma, you let your brains be blown out. Because of human reason alone, there is no pusik. But that's, that's a chiyuv der raisa. So tzfara makes things der raita, or from the tzfara we uncover the, what's from the Torah? Or is it like that thing rabbinical laws are like, kind of like Torah? So what, so what I'm arguing, we have, what I'm arguing is, yes, that tzfara creates halacha. As a chiyuv der raisa. It has to be an extension from a pasik. But that's exactly right. So after, after these several classes, it comes out that we have five different levels of, of derived halacha that we've gone through. We have things that are beyond reason, that they function to remind you, hey, this is God's law. That's chukim. The next level up is there's things that, you know, that, that they're kind of seicheldik, but it would take you more than a lifetime to know. That was my Hurricane Katrina example. Or, you know, the idea that Shabbos keeps the Jewish people. It's not, within our lifetime, it's not obvious that's true, but it is. It's like, you know, if we lived long enough, we'd be able to make that one make sense. That's one step up into the world of Seichel. Then there are things that, well, that Seichel and Halacha obligate us to do. This idea of Svara extending a Halacha, like the example of a Bracha. After food, that's in black and white in the psukim, but we extend that based on human reason alone. That is a chiyuv deraisa to say a bracha rishona. Then there's a, a, another category where there's the, there's a halachic element, but you're actually kind of putter. It's almost like you know, say for example, someone who's blind. You know, he's not obligated to keep the mitzvahs. There's, he has a limitation. But really, like, people who are blind can actually keep mitzvahs. That there's something that, that, um, that the logic demands that you, you keep living a Torah life. It's, you're, not, you're no longer obligated by the text, but now you're obligated by human reason. But it has, it's rooted in the text. And then there's this last category that I've been talking about today is there is no text. You don't need a chumash. You don't need chazal. You don't need a gemara. If it makes rational sense, you are obligated in the same way that you're obligated to keeping Shabbos, in the same way that you're obligated not to kill people. That when human reason demands it, you need to do it. Because we're created in the image of God. We are Tzalem Elohim. We're given that gift, and that gift has a tremendous power and responsibility. We need to exercise that and take our human minds seriously. Yeah, go for it. Um, human nature versus human reasoning, are they opposites? Do they play into each other? We've been, we've been playing with that question in, in, oh, the, in the entire, I mean, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole class has been playing with that question. Right. Complicated. Because, like, I feel like it makes yes sense. Yes and no. They, they're kind of... But I feel like there's a lot of mental illness yeah. where human nature is just, like, goes against reasoning. Yeah, more fallible. We are dealing, we're, we are fallible human beings. That's true. That's true. Which, again, that kind of gets into that, you know, there's a process. Taking from, you know, uh, Avram Ben Rambam, that, you know, you have to prove everything. You have, it, it takes work, ultimately. You're not just given it. But you have the tools to make that work, to make that work possible. For things that are human, um, yeah, human nature, like he created that for a reason, mm -hmm. that might go against the reasoning. How come when we're angry, people, like, people don't necessarily feel the urge so much, but sometimes people say, oh, I want to kill this person. Like, do you think... I mean, that, and, that, and that's kind of like on your, on your question is a similar, similar way of framing it, is, well, like, you know, the, 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 ur, the, ur, the urge to do some of that. Well, I mean, it's, it's a survival, it's a survival response. You know, it's not, ex it's not, that was kind of getting back to this idea of the Eitz Ritovani Eitz we were talking about a couple weeks back, is, well, there's nothing, 
we there's nothing inherently morally good about the Yetzer Tov. There's nothing inherently morally bad about the Yetzer Hara. I mean, it's it's a it is a gray area where sometimes yes, sometimes no. That it's almost like we get. I mean, there there I was kind of outlining this idea that sometimes if you're being a little too good, you end up hurting people. And you know, the example I gave was. Um, you know, over, over caring for somebody, they never actually learn that they are able to take care of themselves. You know, they become too fragile, and that, that has a whole whole ball of wax in terms of problems that go along with that. And your intentions are good, but the outcome is bad. You know, it's, again, it's not morality. Morality is taking into consideration the process, but also the conclusion. Did you actually do something good with your intentions? You can't exactly forget one or the other. So the eights are the eights are Tov and eights are Hara. A lot of times, they're, they're the uh, they're in the world of intention, not the outcome. Yeah, it's But what if it's like you're gullible because like you just don't believe it? People are lying to you. So how is that? <sighs> then you're being dumb, man. Because sometimes people lie. <laughs> So I yeah. should just assume that everyone is always lying to me? No. Nope. You have to have a system where you can sort that one out. I mean, and we do. I mean, we're as people, we're pretty good at catching people lying. You know, there is a higher success rate of, like, noticing. It's like, oh, I, something's off here. I mean, you like, know. some people are just really not street smarts. Is that counting as yep. a... Yep. People have... There are limitations people have. That's a part of the world. That is true. Some people are more intelligent than others. That happens to be true. Maybe the... Um, so it's just kind of you have to gauge that one, you know. Or maybe it's just like ignoring or like not searching or like, I don't want to know, don't tell me. I don't have to like right. scandals if you don't tell me the luck us. Right, are. right. That would that would definitely be a problem. Right. It's like, I'm giving up and going home. I'm not even trying. Right. You know, people have different skills and levels of being able to understand what's going on in their lives. That's for sure true. But it's like on some level you can. You can't just give up in the game and go oh. home, you know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah right. Put your yeah. Put your ears and put your fingers in your ears and say la la la. That's not gonna fly. Yeah. Um, you said yes or tov and yes or ra are in the world of intention. They are. Are. They're mostly they're mostly about intention. What you're what you're what you're compel what you're motivated towards. So I kind of think of the yates or hara as as um as um a type of like survival instinct. You know, surviving isn't inherently bad. But sometimes you can become so scared of wanting to survive, you can hurt people. You know, I mean, that's what people do when they're afraid of something, is that they're misinterpreting their environment as being dangerous, going into survival mode, yelling, screaming, and hollering. They're misreading the situation, thinking they're, they're in too much danger, when in fact they're not. That's really what's going on. It's, um, it's survival skill gone haywire. Yeah. Um, you said, what was the end of the sentence? You said, but they're not something. But they're not. They're not. They're not so much about the consequence, the outcome. And I've More or less. I mean, that's not exactly so straightforward, but it's a yeah. kind of starting sense. position. It's a fair way of putting it without getting but too complicated. But I think that's only if a person being more impulsive, though. Because if they're not being impulsive, then they're not thinking. Thinking. It's not really. Like, do you get what I mean? It, like, it's, if they're impulsive, then they're not thinking about the outcome. They're just, it's instinct. Well, I would say, like, impulse is, like, I would put it another way, is, like, we're always thinking about the outcome. It's just what's the span of time we're looking at. That's usually more, like, short-term thinking. Like, we always think about the consequence. It's impossible not to. Like, but it's, like, what consequences do we care about? The one that's going to happen right now, man, I want to drink that Coke. Or the long-term consequence of, I might drink that Coke, but guess what? I'm going to be gaining pounds I don't want and end up with, with heart problems because I have diabetes. So it's like, it's a matter of time that you're looking yeah. at. So people with, like, I guess more, like, a healthier level of having it around your throat tub is when they look ahead of time and not just... Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. All right, I think someone else wants to come in, guys, so I got I to gotta skip out.